Good evening, my dear viewer, and praise God. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Kobia Michubu. Christ, our Lord, has saved me. I'm a lay preacher in Kawagware circuit. And this week, I bring to you our midweek sermon. And before we start, let us pray for the word. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we are humbled at the feet of mercy this evening to receive from you. Speak to us, Lord, in a language we understand, and may your word impart our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. And so, today we are going to look at a message titled, Understanding Times and Seasons. And we are going to get our guiding scripture from the book of First Chronicles, chapter 12, starting from verse 23 to 37. And I will read. The topic is list of David's forces. When David was at Hebron, many trained soldiers joined his army to help make him king in place of Saul, as the Lord had promised. Their numbers were as follows. Judah, 6,800 well-equipped men armed with shields and spears. Simeon, 7,100 7, well-trained men. Levi, 4,600 men. Followers of Joahida, descendants of Heron, 3,700 men. Relatives of Zadok, a neighbor young fighter, 22 leading men. Benjamin, Saul's own tribe, 3,000 men. Most of the people of Benjamin and remained loyal to Saul. Ephraim, 20,800 men famous in their own clans. West Manasseh, 18,000 men chosen to go and make David king. Issachar, 200 leaders together with the men under their command. These leaders knew what Israel should do and the best to do it, the best time to do it. Zebulun, 50,000 loyal and reliable men ready to fight, trained to use all kinds of weapons. Naphtali, 1,000 leaders together with that 7,000 men armed with shields and spears. Dan, 28,600 trained men. Asher, 40,000 men ready for battle. Tribes east of Jordan, Reuben, Gad, and East Manasseh, 120,000 men trained to use all kinds of weapons. And so, before we even go very far, I want us to look at the definitions of times and seasons. The definition of time, the first definition, there are many we look at two. It is indefinite continued progress of existence and the events in the past, present, and the future regarding the Sawo. The next definition of time is a point of time as measured in hours and minutes past midnight or noon. For example, we may say the time now is 9.30 a.m. In the book of Ecclesiastes, if we read what the Bible says about times, it tells us that if you read from chapter three, in chapter 3, the first verse tells us that the scriptures, or the scripture tells us that everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. And if we can read through verse 2 to 8, I will read quickly through verse 2 to 8. It tells us, He sets the time from birth and the time for death, the time for planting and the time for pulling up, the time for killing and the time for healing, the time for tearing down and the time for building. He sets the time for sorrow and the times for joy, the time for mourning and the time for dancing, 
the time for making love and the time for not making love. The time for kissing and the time for not kissing. He sets the time for finding and the time for losing. The time for saving and the time for throwing away. The time for tearing and the time for mending. The time for silence and the time for talk. He sets the time for love and the time for hate. The time of war, the time for war and the time for peace. That is what the scripture tells us about time. Let us look at season. The first definition of season is a period of the year that is distinguished by special climatic conditions. And uh, one of the four main periods of a year, they include the spring, the summer, the autumn, and the winter. These are the main four seasons in a year. And uh, we can look at briefly at what these seasons look like. The spring is the weather where it is warm and often wetter, melting of snow and increased rainfall. Summer, temperatures increase to the hottest of the year. This is the hottest period of the year, that is summer. Autumn, temperatures cool again and the plants begin to grow dormant. Animals might prepare themselves for the cold weather, which is winter. And the winter often brings a chill. Some areas may experience snow or ice, while others see only cold rain. The lowest temperature in a winter to be ever recorded was minus 89.2 degrees Celsius. This was in 21st July 1983, and this is by ground measurements on the surface of the earth. Minus 99.2 degrees Celsius, winter. It becomes extremely cold. And from the book of Second Timothy, we read a section of the scripture where Paul is talking to his young assistant, Timothy. And he is telling him to make every effort to come to him before winter. Paul is describing the cold season because he knows if it comes to winter, Timothy might not be able to travel. Traveling through winter can be very difficult. Paul is also talking about the winter in his life. He had discovered that his days were coming near to the end. He was writing this letter when he was in prison and he was going through a lot of trouble, a lot of problems, and he knew that his death was imminent. And that is why he is telling uh, Timothy to bring his coat, to bring uh, other things. This is to prepare him for the weather. And he is also telling him to make sure he comes before the winter falls on his life. So, my dear brethren, both animals, human beings, and even plants always find a behavioral adaptation for each of the season, failure to which they will die. For example, the cold seasons, like let's say when the winter was minus 89 degrees Celsius, if you don't have warm clothing, if you don't have proper preparation, even in your house, definitely you're going to die. Because this is extremely, extremely cold weather. The last definition of a season is a period of time in a year when something happens, most often, or when something is usually done. In the old days, our elders would interpret the weather and the climatic patterns, and they would predict what would happen next. Hence, they would prepare for it. For example, they will start cultivating their lands in preparation for the rains. My late grandma, may I saw rest in peace, when I was a young boy, she would at times tell me 
that she and her feeling that they would reign not long after, and truly they would reign. And so we see that in the old days, I don't know whether it is the case today, our elders would perfectly interpret the weather, the climatic uh, uh, conditions, and they will prepare for it so that they will not be caught off guard. Now, aside from the natural seasons that we have seen, as human beings and as Christians, we also have seasons in our lives. And I want us to look at six common seasons in the life of a Christian, or the life of a believer, or the life of a human being. The first season is the dry season. The dry season is the tough season, and it is when God is quiet, and uh, you can't hear his voice or sense his presence as you once did. In a dry season, God seems to be very distant. The second season is the waiting season. Sometimes waiting is not easy. We can relate with the stories of Joseph in the book of Exodus. We can relate with the story of Abraham in Genesis and the story of Anna in the book of First Samuel. They can define for us what waiting is and the season of waiting. Our Lord encourages us in the book of Psalms, chapter 37, verse 7, that be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. The third season is the grinding season. This is the busy season. This is the season which is normally described as I don't have enough time to get everything done. As the scripture tells us in Psalms 95 verse 4, be reminded that the whole world does not rest in your hands. It rests in God's hands. Many a times, as people, when we are in the grinding season, when we are very busy, we seem not to create room for God. We get immersed in our own things, and we get to forget God. So don't make a mistake of getting, forgetting God in your busy season. The fourth season is the season of tests and the trials. Tests and the trials. This is the season of hard times. Just like we are going through a season of hard time at this point in, in our country and indeed in the whole universe. And the book of James, you will read from, the, from chapter 1 to verse 12. As hard as the tests and the trials may be, allow God to be God. Allow him to strengthen and increase your faith in this season of hardship and affliction. Fix your eyes on Jesus, but not on, on your trial. The faith season is the spiritual warfare season. This is a season of being spiritually attacked. And be, normally because you are doing something right that the Satan doesn't like. But whether or not you are currently walking faithfully before God, the enemy will always wage war against you. And we know our enemy is the devil. It comes, this automatically comes with being a Christian. But don't be afraid. The story of Job tells us that God is always in complete control. No matter the kind of warfare you go through. Remember, this is not a natural battle against flesh and blood. Even though it may appear to be so. As the book of Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 tells us, with this battle in mind, we must put on the full spiritual armor of God 
And this we can read from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 13 to 17. You will check this in your own free time. The last season is called the happy season. This is the fun season. The happy season when you are doing well, when your family is doing all right, when things are moving in the right direction. And during these happy seasons, people seem to forget God. Remember, you have a duty, even in the upper season, to praise the Lord. The book of James, chapter 5, verse 13, tells us, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is, there, is anyone a pay? Let them sing songs of praise. Ultimately, God is in control of all the seasons. Whichever season you are currently in, remember that God is making everything beautiful in its time. As I draw towards the conclusion of my message, I would like to share this story that is told of a Chinese wise man and his disciple. And one day, in their traveling, as they were moving to a far land, they saw a desolate hut house. And they thought maybe it was not occupied. But as they approached, they indeed confirmed that the house was occupied. The house and a man with his wife and three children and also they had one thin and a very skinny cow. And so because they were angry, they were thirsty, they were welcomed, and they were given something to take. And then they were dumbfounded and they kept, they asked to the family, how do you survive in this place with no trees, with no plantation, how do you survive? And the man of the house told them that, do you see that skinny cow over there? That is the cow that sustains us. That is the cow that gives us milk. We take the milk and make cheese. And when there is a reminder, we go to the market and exchange for other goods. That is how we survive. And they bid the family farewell and they went. When they had just made one bend around the corner, the wise man told his disciple, I would like you to go back, take that cutthroat, and push it off the cliff. Obviously, the young man, the disciple, was very surprised. How heartless his master could be. Why would he tell him? Why would he show? Or how would he be such an ungrateful person when he has just been served and welcomed and he now he wants to kill the only means of survival for this family? But the master didn't have options. He repeated the order again to the young disciple. And then because the disciple had to follow and obey his master, he went back took the kettle and pushed it off the cliff and it died. And off they went and they reached home. But this young disciple lived with guilt, conscious that probably these people that he left, they had died. Probably they, they had encountered so many problems because of what he did. And at one time he decided to leave his master on his own and to go and check on the family. And when he approached the place from a distance, he saw a lavish house. He saw trees and vegetations. He saw swimming pools. And he could see people who were like in a celebration mood. And he was a bit shocked. 
So when he, when he almost arrived, he talked to a person, passersby, one of the passersby around, and he asked, Do you, could you be aware of what happened to the family that used to live here some years back? And this person told him, this is the family. This is the family you can see. It is the same family. And this man, the disciple, was so surprised. And when he arrived at the home, he clearly identified the man. And the children now are healthy, in good shape, and grown teenagers. The family was in, uh, they were doing very good, very well. And he asked the man of the house, how come, how did you change this situation? How did you, what happened? And he told the young disciple, we had a cow, a thin cow, which kept on, was our survival. But at one point, it then dropped off the cliff and died. And this gave us an opportunity to look for new ways of survival. It then gave, gave us room to think more and to do things in a different way. And right now, this is how you see us because we have been doing things differently. The moral of the story, or this story, is asking us today, who or what is that cow in your life that you need to push off the cliff? Many a time we let our dependence on certain people, things or situations, which create a comfort zone and limit us from reaching greater things. And this story got me thinking. And I remembered when we were young boys uh, in our family, I used to see many subsistence, subsistence farmers. They used to, to keep these kind of cows that we used to call Congoni, Congoni cows. These were a very ungrateful breed of cows. No matter how you fed them, they only gave you one cup of milk, or even less. At times they were also violent. They would, even when you milk that one cup, they would kick and pour it all together. And I struggled as I was thinking through this world. I struggled to understand why many people, including us, why we kept this kind of a cattle for many years. We only came to see change when our family bought the famous Frisian cows. Frisian had a lot of milk. We moved from milking with a cup, we went to milking with a bucket or the sufria. And that time you could get enough to drink and take from the family and even to sell and share with other people. Understanding times require that you decide when to let go. If a Congon cow is giving you one cup of cup of milk continuously for five years, just let it go. Sell it and buy a calf from a better breed. You don't know greatness by letting go that which is unproductive. It becomes a time to let go of a job and start a new chapter. There comes a time to let go even a business. If you haven't made a profit in 10 years in your business, just let it go and discover new ways, just like that poor family. After their cattle was thrown off the cliff, they discovered new ways of doing things. This is called understanding times. When you understand what, you ought, to, what ought to be done at different times and seasons, you will have authority. You will make progress and you will move out of stagnation. If you can't understand what God is doing, you will remain in the same position all the time. Times and seasons are different. So learn to understand each and adapt to their uniqueness. I have seen, like in this season we are in, people trying to adopt 
For example, the taxi drivers. During the period of lockdown and closure, when there is totally no business, zero business, they went and uh, converted their cars into groceries, and you could see them selling groceries on the highways. This is adaptation and a progressive mind. Our guiding scripture today from the book of First Chronicles, chapter 12, talks about King David's great army. Thousands and thousands of men trained in warfare. They were drawn from various tribes of Judah and Israel. After the fall and death of King Saul, Many trained soldiers joined King David's army to help make him king, just as God had promised. During the time of a regime change, the military is key. And this is why David had gathered a mighty great army. Military is key in regime change. Military dictates who becomes the next leader. If military refuses, you will never become a leader. However, what is of interest today to us is not the big army that came to support David, but the small group of men we read from verse 32. These men, we are, they are called the men of Issachar. When the other tribes were contributing huge numbers, of soldiers, well trained and equipped, we are told that the men of Issachar understood and knew what Israel should do. They were 200. 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. These group of 200 men was the most valuable asset in David's army. It is not over the 200,000 army men. It is the 200 chiefs, the men of Issachar with their families because they guided the strategy of the warfare. What matters is not the largeness of an army but the strategy. A government without the 200 men of Issachar will definitely collapse. It is my prayer and the hope that even in our country, in Uhuru Kenyatta's government, there is a 200 men of Issachar that will keep on correctly interpreting the times for him so that he will guide the nation in the right way. Knowing times and the seasons can mean the difference between perishing and surviving. Knowing what to do in every season can spell the difference between life and death. My prayer today, as I conclude, for everyone watching and listening to this message, is that God gives you the spirit of the men of Issachar. And you will be able to know what you should do in different times and the seasons of your life. In the name of the God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, your hand has come to us at this point in time. You are teaching us to understand seasons and times. I pray, Lord, that you may give us the spirit of the men of Isaac. The Lord, we may know times and the seasons. I pray for all believers and the people that call you God. Give them this spirit, Lord, that they may not perish, but they will live through the seasons and the times that are different in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen.